Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Keith Crivello. I am a um, orthopedic surgeon with a specialty in hand and upper extremity uh, with Mercer Bucks Orthopedics. Um, what that means is I, I went to medical school at Boston University. I did my orthopedic uh, residency at um, St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital in New York City, and then I did a special uh, hand surgery fellowship. Um, and hand surgery and orthopedics sort of usually represents the whole upper extremity at the um, Hospital for Special Surgery in New York. Uh, today we're going to talk about the uh, some common uh, conditions with the hand, wrist, and elbow. We'll focus on those things. Um, as the slide says, I have no financial relationships to disclose. And there we go. Oops, sorry, the uh, we're getting used to this, uh, this format. Uh, clicking through here. There was a little lag. Um, so goals today, we're going to try to discuss some of these afflictions and discuss some of the treatments. So we'll start right in with the, uh, with the wrist. Um, one of the more common things that I see here in the office uh, has a cute nickname. It's called Mommy Wrist, and it's got a fancy name called Decrayer Veins Tenosynovitis. Um, it is a little bit more common in women, and um, we do sometimes see that in, um, in uh, new mothers, new grandmothers as they're uh, lifting up the baby, uh, as you could see in that previous slide, which is jumping around a little bit. Uh, uh, we see it a lot, you know, in, in pregnancy, also in postpartum as they're, as they're lifting up the baby. Um, typically, the pain is around the thumb side of the wrist and, uh, and the thumb itself. Um, what actually is happening is two of the tendons that control your thumb, that make the thumb go up, uh, get caught in this little compartment on the side of the wrist. Um, they've got fancy names, they, but they basically work to control the thumb. Um, when they get a little bit inflamed, they can rub on that little sheath and that can cause a lot of discomfort. Um, the, um, there's a number of different treatments for this. Um, and I'm gonna show you another picture uh, when we talk about the surgical treatment of, of how those tendons look along the side of the wrist. But typically we always try to do non-surgical things first and a splint such as this that you can wear uh, at bedtime is often very helpful. Um, we will often do cortisone injections for this problem. And you know, you'll hear me talk about cortisone. It's, it's not one of those things where it's a cures all, but it's a sort of a common theme with a lot of the things that we talk about in, um, in orthopedics. Um, often it's a cure, it can, you know, 60 to 70% of the time it cures if it goes away forever. Um, occasionally it makes it go away temporarily and then it comes back. And then that's where we start talking about other things like surgery. Um, the surgery is usually a pretty small procedure. Uh, most of the folks that do make it to the operating room for, uh, for this have, um, usually they have a little separate compartment for that one tendon. So this picture actually shows the two tendons that are involved in separate compartments, which is, which is often how, how it happens when folks fail the conservative treatments. Um, folks that usually get better with an injection or that never have the problem at all, often these tendons are just in, in one little compartment. That's usually the distinction between folks that, that get better without uh, surgery and folks that do need the operation. And basically what you do with the operation is you just open up this, this little compartment so the tendons don't rub anymore and, and uh, it's a pretty successful operation. Um, moving right along, um, another problem that we see very, very commonly uh, involves having a little bit of arthritis at the base of the thumb. So here is an x-ray and this is the joint that we're looking at, which is um, this one, the base of your thumb down here, um, where I'm squeezing on my own hand. Um, very, very common problem. We see a lot of, a lot of times you, you hear stories of folks having trouble opening up jars or pinching things, turning keys and doorknobs. Um, those are, uh, those are usually the symptoms. This is uh, something often it can hurt worse at night. Um, again, a little bit more common in women rather than men, but, uh, but you know, we, we definitely see it in both genders. Um, I can tell you certain surgeries I do, my, my basal joint starts to bark a little bit afterwards or maybe even a day afterwards too. So it's something that, that uh, is very, very common. Um, again, common themes here. There are a number of different splinting options. Um, something that's relatively new is this, this splint down here, which I love because it's very low profile. It, um, leaves the rest of your hand free, but it selectively immobilizes that one arthritic joint. Um, we also, in the past, have used these custom splints. Uh, nighttime, nighttime use is, uh, is common. Again, common themes, cortisone injections can be helpful. Uh, the word arthritis means inflammation of the joint, and cortisone is a powerful anti-inflammatory. And so cortisone injections, though not curative, can be very, very helpful for um, controlling the symptoms. 
And um, we are surgeons, and so there are surgical options for this. Again, once you've exhausted all of your uh, non-surgical treatments, um, there are surgeries that address this. Um, most of the surgeries involve taking out one of those bones. So this one bone called the trapezium, which is one of the arthritic bones, just gets removed. You can see in this little, uh, this little picture here, here's the bone, it just gets taken out. And then we do something to reconstruct the ligaments that support that joint um, and something to fill in that space. Now your body will fill it in with just sort of uh, hematoma, which is like blood clot and scar tissue. And so you don't necessarily need to stick something in there, but one of the techniques does involve putting a little rolled up piece of tendon in there. Um, one of the ways that I've started doing this procedure, which I, I find to be um, uh, a nice technique is uh, with this device called the mini tightrope, which is basically a suture that uh, suspends the thumb. This, this uh, where the mouse is pointing is the thumb, uh, it's called the thumb metacarpal. Um, it suspends that thumb metacarpal to the index finger metacarpal, the next bone over. And you can see in this procedure, we just take that trapezium out, it's just gone, and it just fills in with scar tissue. And um, folks tend to uh, be able to start moving a little bit faster with this technique, and that's why I like to, like to use that. Um, again, just moving right along, we'll um, move into another very, very common uh, issue that we see uh, involving hand numbness. I'm sure anybody has ever, everyone here has heard of uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, which is one of the conditions that cause numbness in the hand. It's the most common condition that causes numbness in the hand. Um, it's also the most common form of what we call peripheral nerve compression. Um, so carpal tunnel syndrome um, is a compression of a nerve called the median nerve, and um, it's very aptly named. It actually, there actually is a little tunnel. So these bones, these are the bones in the wrist. Imagine if you took your hand and you sliced it like this, um, you'd be looking down on the wrist, and there actually is a tunnel. Um, this little space has nine tendons in that one nerve that typically gets compressed, and the roof of this tunnel is a ligament that can sometimes push on that nerve. Um, and that can cause the numbness and sometimes weakness and dysfunction in the hand. Um, the, um, this is just a little schematic drawing showing where that, where that structure is, where that, uh, where that tunnel lies in terms of your hand. And um, this is a little cartoon showing a little compression of that nerve. You can see it's getting a little, um, little swollen in that area. And you can see the associated tendons that run with the nerve. Um, we don't really know if that there's a, a um, true cause of this. Um, it, there are some associations. There's some folks that are just born with anatomy that congenitally predisposes them to this. Uh, if you use a, um, uh, you know, a um, heavy construction equipment that uses a lot of vibration, sometimes that can cause it, uh, can cause irritation of the nerve and extra compression. Um, we see this a lot during pregnancy. Often it's temporary during pregnancy, but we do see it a lot during pregnancy. Um, clearly, if you had a, a big tumor or a cyst or something growing in, the, in, that, in that tunnel that's compressing the nerve, that can be a cause. And um, some underlying medical conditions also um, can, can be associated with this, such as diabetes or thyroid disease. Um, I don't know when it was, was uh, even I think before my time, but um, this somehow got associated with computer use. And there really is no known association with um, computer use. Um, it's... Uh, repetitive tasks, things like that. Um, there's not, other than the fact that that could cause some inflammation of the tendons that run with the nerve, um, there's, there's no known cause. So, you know, um, you can't really blame your, uh, your computers or your, 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 uh, your iPhones um, just yet. Um, again, this is just another schematic. This picture shows that tunnel, a little cartoon of that tunnel, and here's the, uh, the tendons running with the nerve. There's that, that ligament. And if you look at the the red fingers, basically, those are the fingers that are um, that that nerve supplies. So if you look at this little picture down here, that's the distribution of that nerve. So it's really the thumb, index, long finger, and and the one side of the ring finger. Um, again, not everybody is you know not everybody's hand reads the textbooks, and sometimes people uh, will uh, people will also have some you know varying varying symptoms. It's um, I see a wide spectrum of things and. Uh, again, numbness is, is primarily the, the, the main symptom, but it also can result in some weakness, clumsiness, dropping objects, and pain is often involved waking at night. Um, people will often tell me, oh yeah, I wake up at night and I have to hang my hand off the side of the bed or I have to shake it and it starts to feel better. Driving is another one where people often have these symptoms. 
So uh, in terms of the treatment, again, some common themes, using a splint at night can be helpful. It keeps the wrist in a straight position. That nerve gets compressed when the nerve is like this or like this. And so if you sleep like this for eight hours, that's gonna add a lot of compression to the nerve and that's gonna make things worse. Um, I'm not a big fan of cortisone for this problem because it's usually temporary. I usually use cortisone more as a diagnostic test than as a treatment. Um, and of course there is a surgery for this, which is a pretty small procedure. Um, you know, usually only takes about 10 minutes or so to do. Um, so there's different ways to do the surgery. Um, you can do it through a small open incision. You could do it through uh, using a little camera or a little scope. Um, there's never been any, any benefit other than maybe a slightly increased um, uh, or slightly um, faster return to work with the endoscopic because it's a little bit of a smaller incision. Um, but uh, there's really no difference between open or the, or the camera. And most people do fantastically well. Uh, again, depending on how much compression you have and for how long you've had that compression, that will affect your, your ultimate recovery and your result. But most people do really, really well after that. Um, the second most common type of nerve compression involves those other two fingers. So we talked about the fingers, the red fingers for the um, carpal tunnel, the ones that are dark blue in this picture, that is a different nerve. It's called the ulnar nerve. Um, now that nerve can get compressed in a couple of different places, but the most common place where it gets compressed is around the elbow. Um, so that's the funny bone nerve when, you're, when your elbow slides and you get that jolt of pain going uh, up your forearm and into your hand, that's because you've, you've slid and you hit that, that ulnar nerve that's going around the inside part of your elbow. Um, that nerve uh, can get compressed from a couple of things. One, there is a, lig a, a small ligament that does cover the nerve, similar to the, in the carpal tunnel. The other thing is just the nature of that nerve going through the back part of the elbow. So if you were to tie a string to my hand and run it down the back of my arm and, and uh, tape it to the back of my arm and then bend the elbow up like this, that string is going to get a little taut as it goes around the elbow, right? And so that's what happens with this nerve sometimes. It gets a little taut as it goes around the bottom part of the elbow. So um, again, similar, tr similar um, concepts with the treatment. Um, wearing, this is a little rigid, we usually use softer things, but you, wearing something that keeps the elbow extended at night so it, it can't flex and it can't get that, that compression from the flexion, uh, that's one of the options. Or you can do the surgery. and. Um, the, there's two different ways to do the surgery. Again, um, the way I favor most of the time is taking that nerve and instead of getting pinched as it bends, if you take it and you move it from the bottom part of the elbow to the top part of the elbow, when it bends, it doesn't get kinked anymore. And so there's no more compression. Um, there, have been some, there has been some uh, research that has shown that just opening up that ligament, just decompressing that nerve um, is, is equal to transposing it. It's a little bit of a smaller incision and a little bit of a um, a little, little slightly increased uh, uh, quicker recovery, but uh, there's no difference between those two. Um, I do favor the transposition because it, it sort of, to me, it, it sort of favors the, the anatomical uh, considerations for, uh, for, for the compression. Um, another very, very common uh, issue, that getting away from the nerves and the numbness, involves uh, the tendons that, that bend our fingers. Um, so something called the trigger finger, which I'm sure lots of folks have heard about. Um, the tendons that bend our fingers in this direction go through little tunnels. They're called pulleys. And this is a little cartoon of that picture. The gray part here is the tendon and the lighter, lighter gray, the dark gray is the tendon. The lighter gray is the uh, little pulley system. And if the tendon gets a little swollen, you can get a little nodule that forms around that tendon sheath. And then it gets stuck as it goes through that little tunnel. Um, imagine taking your belt, tying it in a loop, and trying to pull it, uh, trying to pull it through the belt loops in your pants. It gets stuck. Um, so different things can occur. You can sometimes just get a little catching. Sometimes it's just pain. Sometimes it's just pain from the inflammation. Sometimes it's that nodule so big that finger actually gets stuck in a locked position, and you actually have to use your other hand to to pop it open. So um, similar themes again. Wearing a splint at night that keeps the finger straight can help. Um, a cortisone injection can be curative in uh, 60 to 70 percent of people. Um, and uh, again, similar themes to other problems. If, if these issues don't work, there is a surgery. Um, and typically the surgery just involves, you know, using my analogy from before, it would be like cutting the belt loop. So the cortisone would be like trying to untie the knot in the belt. The surgery is like cutting the belt loop so it doesn't get stuck anymore. And um, when you cut the belt loop, it doesn't rub there anymore, and so it's uh, less inflammation, 
And again, typically that's cured forever. Um, another problem in the hand um, is something called Dupuytren's disease. Um, this is a little less common than some of the other things that I've talked about, but um, uh, there, there's often some confusion between the Dupuytren's disease and the trigger fingers because um, both can result in fingers that get stuck in a bent position. The uh, trigger finger is an issue with the tendon itself as it, as it glides underneath those tunnels. Uh, Dupuytren's disease is actually a condition of the connective tissue that sits on top of the tendons. So that connective tissue can get really, really thickened. And sometimes it's just little nodules that are usually painless. Um, sometimes those nodules thicken and coalesce and then you can end up with a, what we call a cord. Um, oftentimes that can, uh, that cord, as it gets thicker and thicker, it can pull the finger into a bent position and it can get stuck that way. It has nothing to do with the tendons. The tendons move just fine. It's the other tissues on top of the tendons that are getting stuck. Um, it's usually, um, usually genetic. Um, there are some associations with other things like seizure disorders or um, a history of alcoholism, uh, but typically it's more just a genetic condition. And uh, traditionally it's described in um, men of Northern European descent. And there are a number of treatment options for this as well. Um, sometimes you don't have to do anything. You can live with it and it's not bothering you. If it's, if it's a, a small amount of contracture, typically you don't have to be too aggressive. Um, the treatment that I favor is um, a, a type of injection called Zioflex. Now, Zioflex is very different than a cortisone injection. A cortisone injection could be sore for a couple of days, and then hopefully your cure it gets better. Zioflex is a medicine. It's an, it's, it's an enzyme that actually digests that cord. And so what happens is you give the injection, and the next day you come back or the day after, and you actually manipulate the hand, and you're actually sort of tearing that cord. Um, so it's a little bit more involved than like a cortisone injection would be. Um, it, I, I usually counsel folks that, that it's, it's almost more like having a surgery because you, you end up, you can get some swelling and um, there is a little bit of a recovery process involved, but it is a, um, it's a fantastic treatment and um, it also helps you to avoid the operating room. But that being said, there are surgeries also to remove that tissue and uh, allow that finger to move um, as well. All right, so um, you know, moving on to the lumps and bumps. Um, the most common lump and bump that we see in the hand and wrist is called a ganglion cyst. Um, they used to call these Bible cysts because um, uh, they used to tell people to take a Bible or a large book and smack it. I do not recommend that. I, <laughs> I recommend if you do want to get rid of it or if you don't like it or you want to know what it is, uh, coming into one of us and, and letting us uh, take a look at it. Let us take, take a look at it and, and let you know what the, um, the best treatment option is. Um, it, again, uh, very, very, very common. Uh, it's uh, usually, um, we, we don't know exactly where it comes from, but um, typically it, um, uh, we think there's a little sprain of the wrist or it can happen around a tendon sheath and a little fluid will leak out. Um, once that fluid leaks out, um, your body can form a little cyst around it. Um, I don't know, it, it's not a disgusting picture, but coming up I have a, like a surgical picture because I, 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 it, it, you can really see what the cyst looks like. So it's not too gross, but for the faint of heart, just, just so you know, there's going to be a picture with the wrist opened up and a little cyst. Again, not bloody or gross, but I just want to let you know in case you want to shield your eyes. Um, uh, this is just a cartoon of what it looks like. Um, and again, it sort of comes out from the joint surface. Usually there's a little stalk like this. Um, sometimes they get bigger and smaller on their own. Sometimes that's activity related. You know, if you're very, very active, they get a little bigger. When you're a little, uh, little, a little more restful, then, then uh, they tend to go down. Um, they're never dangerous. They never turn into cancer or anything like that. So, um, you know, I always tell people, and here's, here's what it looks like, by the way. There's that picture that's not terribly gross, but, uh, but it is a little opened up. And uh, you can see it's got a very thin wall, but it's filled with like a jelly type material. Um, so, I'll go back to this so, so we don't gross anybody out. But um, again, there's always three things that you can do for this. You, you never have to do anything for it because they're not dangerous. So if it doesn't bother you, then you can live with it. You can always put a needle in there and drain it. Um, I always tell people, flip a coin, you know, 50-50 chance it's going to come back. Um, but I usually recommend trying that at least once if you do want to do something with it. And then, of course, there's a surgical excision where you take it out. And there is still a risk of recurrence um, with surgical excision, but it's much lower than than the 50-50 with the aspiration. Um, all right, moving on to the elbow. So 
by far the most common thing we see with uh, elbow pain is uh, lateral epicondylitis or otherwise known as tennis elbow. Um, tennis elbow has many different names um, and uh, you know the most common things that we hear are tennis elbow lateral epicondylitis is also known as enthesopathy of the extensor carpi radialis brevis which is actually the most um, accurate name and I know that's a lot, it's a mouthful, but um, what that means is it's not a true tendonitis. Um, actually what happens is there's uh, little micro tears of the tendons that bring your wrist up like this. So um, pretty much everything we do in life, we do with our wrist back like this. Next time you go to grab something, um, we don't think about it, we just do it naturally, but you get a much stronger grip by bringing your wrist back. So if you bring your wrist back, you, you can grab things a little bit more tightly and you don't, again, you don't think about it, but you're doing it. So all day, every day, you're bringing your wrist back without thinking about it. Um, what happens is the little tendons that allow you to do that will get little, little bits of damage. And then if the damage processes outpace your body's repair mechanisms, then, then you end up with this problem. Um, the good news about tennis elbow is no matter what we do, it typically gets better. So if you have patience, it will probably get better. The bad news is, um, there's not one particular thing that, oh, if you just take this medicine or just do this one thing, it'll be better in a week. Um, there's been thousands of, of uh, different papers written about tennis elbow and various different types of treatment. There have been a number of things that have been tried and showed eh, kind of results. Um, and so, uh, you know, most of us will come up with our own little protocols for these things. Uh, but in terms of treatment, there's a number of different things to do. Um, uh, believe it or not, wearing a brace on the wrist, even though the problem's at your elbow, wearing a brace at your wrist is helpful. Again, the problem is if you put your hand on your elbow right here and you move your wrist up like this, you're going to feel stuff moving, right? So the idea is if you immobilize the wrist, you're allowing that stuff on the elbow to calm down. Um, stretching, I think, is very important. There is a, um, uh, a particular set of stretching exercises that I always recommend that folks do. These little counterforce braces um, used to be more popular. Um, I'm not a huge fan of them because it's, it's hard to, to control the position of where they end up. Um, the idea behind those are um, they put pressure on a spot away from where those tendons insert so that when you move your wrist, it distributes those forces away from the, those little micro tears. Um, they, they do work and it's, it's definitely an option, but um, it's, it's not one of my favorites because that little counterforce brace tends to move around and there's also a little nerve in that area that can sometimes get compressed if it ends up in the wrong spot. I like to do things in two phases. So I like to do the splinting and stretching first and then we move on to some strengthening and therapy. Um, so uh, I like this device, the flex bar, and there's a, a particular technique. It uses um, uh, something called eccentric strengthening exercises, um, which are um, which are very helpful for these types of enthesopathy problems. Um, so I'm a big fan of these. I also am a big fan of our, our physical therapy colleagues helping out because they do a fantastic job. Um, in terms of injections, so um, cortisone has been traditionally used for this problem. Um, and it's always been a little bit controversial, but recently some more evidence has come out that people feel excellent in the short term. But if you look at the data, people actually have worse long-term outcomes with cortisone. And um, there are some reasons for that. Uh, again, it's, it's not a true inflammation. And like I said before, cortisone is an anti-inflammatory. Um, cortisone can delay healing and we're looking to jumpstart healing. Um, that being said, I haven't sworn it off completely. Uh, I use it very uh, limited in a very limited fashion, but um, I also sort of think that the the needle itself can sometimes stimulate a little healing around that, that tendon. And so I think that there is some there is, um, there, there can be a benefit. Um, in addition, I have had, you know, I haven't had exactly the same results that those studies have, studies have shown. I have, it's not like it's universal that everybody has a worse long-term outcome. So in a limited fashion, I'd consider the quarters, right? But um, again, part of it is because I think that the, uh, the needle itself can stimulate healing, which brings me to the next sort of treatment um, option. Um, something called platelet-rich plasma is a a uh, system where you draw some blood out of the arm, spin it in a centrifuge to isolate the healing factors, um, and then you re-inject those healing factors to try to stimulate the healing. Um, for every study that says this is the greatest thing since sliced bread, there's another one that says, eh, it's, it's not the greatest thing since sliced bread. So it's not 100% proven. It's not, not, you know, none of these things are 
Um, and the huge downside to the platelet rich plasma is that it's not generally covered by insurance. But again, it's, it's another option and it's uh, potentially something that could uh, keep you out of the operating room if you fail all other treatments. Um, there is a surgery for this. Um, you can either, there's many different surgeries actually. Um, there's a, something called 10X, which is like a, a small incision and a little ultrasound. Um, you can make a small, you know, maybe about this big incision just to um, basically get rid of the, the, the unhealthy stuff and leave room for your body to add healthy stuff. It, um, you can also do this through the scope. Um, most people get better, 95% improvement with this. Um, and um, there's really no difference in, in which surgical procedure you choose in terms of the results overall. Um, last thing I just wanted to talk about with the elbow is another common issue, something called olecranon bursitis. So we have bursa in our shoulders, in our knees, or around any joint basically there's a bursa. It's a little sac um, that occurs and this is a little cartoon that just kind of shows it. Um, this cartoon is good, but it's, it's not perfect because that bursa can actually come down the forearm somewhat. Sometimes people will have with this issue where that fluid will um, get trapped in that bursa. Um, sometimes it looks like a little golf ball. Sometimes I've seen, seen them as big as softballs coming off the elbow, but sometimes I've also seen them go down the forearm a little bit. Um, so um, it, it generally doesn't cause a ton of discomfort. There is some inflammation involved. Often sort of leaning on the elbow can be a, um, a source of this. Um, occasionally they could get infected, but I would say that most of the time when I see this issue, it's not an infected one, it's just some inflammation. Um, again, not dangerous at all. Um, things that work well for this are uh, little compression sleeves or an elbow pad. You can put a needle in it to, to drain it, drain the fluid. Again, like anything that we drain, it can always come back, but, um, but it can be very effective. And sometimes combining the draining it with the compression sleeve can be helpful as well. Um, rarely, but you know, occasionally, especially if they get infected, um, they can go to surgery. Um, in addition, sometimes people, when, when this bursa gets uh, inflamed, the walls of that bursa can get a little thickened. And so sometimes it can feel a little lumpy. And um, occasionally I've had folks that have had that and they've wanted to take it out just because it, it feels strange when they lean on it or they don't like the way it looks. Um, but rarely does this, does this go to surgery. Um, so um, I wanted to get through all that material. Uh, I know I went a little bit quickly through some of those topics and I'm more than happy to answer whatever questions anybody might have. Um, and uh, and leave some time for that. I think we may have, um, I'm gonna click here, hopefully that works. Um, okay, uh, this question, uh, first question here is what office do I, do I work out of? And um, I work out of actually all of our offices. So uh, we have offices, I'm currently right now in the, our Princeton office, which is right across from the hospital, uh, right on um, the, that forestal uh, complex, right across the street from uh, Princeton Medical Center. Um, we have an office in Hamilton, an office in Lawrenceville, and uh, an office in Langhorne. And um, typically I'm in each office each week. If uh, another question that's come up, uh, if I think I have carpal tunnel syndrome, when should I come in? Well, um, if you suspect any kind of a nerve compression, if you're having symptoms like numbness, um, it's, it's usually a good idea to get that checked out sooner rather than later. Um, Again, there's a whole spectrum, and if you have mild or moderate compression, it's not um, it's not something that's going to need may not need some urgent treatment. But that being said, any kind of nerve compression, the longer a nerve stays compressed, the higher the risk that you can end up with a permanent injury. Now, again, most people that I see don't have severe compression, don't have uh, a risk of a permanent injury. But you know, we do see folks that that you know sort of either ignore it or they. Um, they let it go or they don't think it think it's much of anything. And then if it gets to a certain point, then um, you might not be able to reverse those symptoms with just a simple decompression. Or in, if it's if it's a milder case, often folks, you know, immediately have relief from treatment. Um, if the more severe compression, it could take a lot longer. It could take up to a year plus to, to, to see what your final result is going to be after um, after treatment. So with any kind of nerve compression, I always recommend, you know, um, getting it, getting it checked out uh, sooner rather than later. So let me, uh, let me check these also here. So can Zyaflex treatments be repeated? Thankfully, most people get better after the first one, but I have done it. Um, I have done it as a repeat treatment. Um, like anything, possibly increased risk to uh, some of the structures if it's a repeat treatment, because you're not sure how the anatomy, if the anatomy gets rearranged at all. Um, 
but I did it very safe. I've done it very safely. So yes, it can be repeated. Um, and then, uh, and, and again, I, I think the Zyflex is fantastic. In my, tr in my training, I, I worked with some of the folks that were um, part of the initial um, FDA approvals for it. So I got to learn a bunch of different little tips and tricks with it. And, um, and I've been very, very pleased with that. Um, the next one on this little chat here, uh, treatment options for osteoarthritis and finger joints. Um, so osteoarthritis in the hand is different than osteoarthritis in the knee or the hip. Um, there are, and it also is very dependent on which joint it's in. So we talked about arthritis at the base of the thumb, which is uh, probably the most common place to get arthritis in the hand. The other place that's very common is at the tips of the fingers. There are, um, again, the surgical options for the arthritis at the base of the thumb we went over. There aren't other fantastic surgical options for arthritis in other parts of the hand. There are joint replacements for some of them, depending on the condition and depending on what your, your um, level of activity is. Um, at the tips of the fingers, typically if it gets so bad and so painful that you're going to do something, we typically just fuse that joint together. And that's a, obviously that, that's, that changes how, how that, most of the time if we get to that point, it's because you don't have much motion in that joint to begin with. Um, but, um, it, and that's typically just a pain operation. Um, other treatments for osteoarthritis, sometimes it, I found with the hands, um, a short course, like a one to two week course, if you're, you know, if there's no reason for you not to be able to take it, if it's not contraindicated by other medications or by other conditions, I, I like a short course of an anti-inflammatory medication. So, you know, like the anti-inflammatory dose of something like Advil Aleve or things like that, sometimes just taking it for a week or two can really kind of build up a level in your system and really make things feel better for a longer period of time. Sometimes a little compression around the joints is helpful. So little things like we have a Coban wrap, it's a little thing you get, you know, at the supermarket, just having a little compression around those joints is sometimes helpful. Or, you know, I don't favor one device or another, but there are some of these little gloves um, out there that provide a little bit of compression. Those can sometimes be helpful. Um, again, you know, common themes, things like cortisone can be helpful as well. Um, there are also some good topical anti-inflammatories out there. Um, so I kind of went backwards. I started with the surgery uh, and, and went back to the, the conservative things. But you know, each each um, folk, each person is sort of individual, and um, we do like to, I, you know I usually kind of uh, figure out which joints are involved. Number one and number two, um, you know, what's the what the source of the the pain is, um, and try to tailor the treatment uh, based on some of those things. Um, I'm going to click back to the other section here. All right. How long did, um, how long did cortisone shot, shots last for arthritic thumbs? I had shots in my thumbs last February. Okay. So um, cortisone can be very variable. I have some folks that basically they know that the cortisone is going to last in three months. Um, so they make an appointment and then uh, they come in and um, they get their injection and then they say, I know this is going to last three months. And before they leave, they make their appointment for, for um, you know, three, three months later. Um, you know, it, but it's variable. Different, um, different people will, um, um, you know, have different amounts of relief. You know, other people will get a year out of it. Some people, I give them an injection and, and you know, I don't see them again because it's, you know, that was all they needed to just get over the hump and then they're okay. Um, it's funny because the other, part, the other thing about the thumb arthritis is the, the x-ray findings don't always correlate directly to the, um, the symptoms, you know, I'll, I'll have some folks that'll come in because they're, they, they sprain their wrist or they had an issue. So we get a wrist x-ray and you happen to capture the thumb in that x-ray and they have the most horrendous looking arthritis you've ever seen on an x-ray. And I ask them, does your thumb hurt you? And they say, no, my thumb never bothers me. Um, other people, usually younger people that, that start to have uh, discomfort. Um, a lot of times you take the x-rays and there's very minimal changes on x-ray, but it can still be very irritated and, and painful. Um, so, you know, it's not a great, I know it's not a definitive answer, but it really is variable from person to person. Um, but we hope to get, you know, at least a couple of months out of, out of a cortisone injection at the very least. So we'll give it uh, another minute or two to uh, see if any other questions pop up. Um, I thank you all for, for joining in, all the folks that came in either uh, live or to anybody that might be watching this uh, from a, uh, on a recording afterwards. I appreciate you giving me the time and, uh, and attention. So um, another question just popped up, a very good question, actually, just on the heels of what I was just talking about. So if I require surgery, what is the protocol for safety considering COVID? So um, 
that's a fantastic question. So um, that's something that we've had to consider basically since this all started and things have evolved and continue to evolve as we get deeper in and we get a better understanding of, of uh, COVID. Um, right, most of the operations that, that I do, um, I work out of, uh, we have a surgery center in Lawrenceville called Mercer County Surgery Center, which is a fantastic facility, wonderful people there. And currently we are testing um, everybody um, before their surgery. Um, so that we're trying to make it um, as much as we possibly can control or making that a COVID free uh, facility. Um, most of the things that I discussed are things that can, can happen in a surgery center. Occasionally folks have other medical issues that are um, where they're not a, a candidate for, for the surgery center. Um, so sometimes they have to go to the hospital and each, depending on which hospital you go to, they have their own, their own protocols as well. Um, <clears throat> the other consideration with surgery is that if a lot of the things that I discussed today, and I didn't get into this before, but a lot of the things, if they get to surgery, they can be done under local anesthesia. So you basically just numb up the area, you do the procedure, and then you never, you never have to see an anesthesiologist. So, um, you know, the risks uh, do increase a little bit when, when you have to um, have a tube, when you have to be intubated, um, but it is, um, it's still very safe. And again, um, we, we are trying to screen things as much as we possibly can. We try to use our staff, our anesthesiologists, our surgeons. We have a questionnaire that we fill out that, 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 um, that we as surgeons will fill out to, to determine your risk um, and whether or not delaying or um, other treatments are available. So we're trying to do things as safely as possible. 100% it is something that we consider and um, you know, there, are, uh, there are safe alternatives. Okay, yeah, uh, Jen's just reminding me, which is a, um, a a great thing to remember on our website, we have um, video walkthroughs of our offices and our surgery center. And um, I, I encourage you to go on that website and take a look at our surgery center. We're really proud of it. it um, it's a brand new building, basically just like a year or two old. Um, and um, a lot of detail went into it and, and we're very proud of it. Um, and another question here. So uh, missed the beginning of arthritis in the thumb. So yes, this video is gonna be sent to you uh, as a recording so you could certainly um, you can certainly watch that as a, uh, as a recording um, afterwards. And Jen's going to also, uh, you can see the, the email address at the bottom. So if you have further questions, even after watching the recording, we're happy to, we're happy to answer as much as, as possible. A couple parts to the question. Um, how successful is surgery? Um, again, no surgery is ever 100%, but this is a, um, in general, a very, people do pretty well. It, I, I like to be realistic with expectations and I usually tell people that it's a good three months before you forgot that you had surgery. So there is a little bit of a recovery involved with it. Um, but again, it's gradual. It's not like an all or nothing thing where you're, you know, completely down for the count and then at three months later, you're, you're, you're back to normal. Um, <clears throat> nickel screws. No. Um, so I'm sorry. The part of the question is, do you put in nickel screws? So um, again, there's a couple different ways to do the operation and there certainly are ways to do it without any, hardware at all with just basically suture and tendon. Um, that I did show a, a diagram of a way that I like to do it that involves a little button. So the, the, the actual button that's in there is like, if you extend your, your pen tip, it's about the size of that pen tip. And that just holds the suture in place. And um, I believe that that's either titanium or stainless steel. I don't believe that there is any nickel involved, but you know, certainly there are alternatives if you do have allergies to things. Um, and second opinions, uh, I, I, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to give a second opinion one. Um, you know, the, we typically like for anybody to um, sort of provide us with previous records just so we have an idea of what, what's been done before. Um, but I'm more than happy to give a second opinion. Um, and I think I just touched the last part of the question or I touched on before, how long is recovery? And again, that's a little bit different for, for uh, different people are, um, are different, but, and again, it's not all or nothing, but with the thumb operation, I usually, tell you to bank on, on feeling a little different for, for about three months. Uh, you know, some people get back to normal a little faster than others, but, but, you know, at least sort of bank that time that you might, you might be still sort of in the, in, in a bit of a recovery process. And um, how do I make a, an appointment with you via your website? I've looked at our website many times, but I've never, never tried to make an appointment personally. So I'll confess, I, I can't give you the uh, the play-by-play -play exactly how to do that, but it is 100% um, an option to do that. And um, uh, Jen's just giving me the, uh, the heads up that she can answer that question uh, afterwards also.
Well, thank you so much, Dr. Cravallo. I appreciate your time. Um, with regards to how to make an appointment via our website, if you go to www.mbortho.com, as soon as you pull up that website, there's a button that says appointment request. You can't miss it. It's kind of the only button on the front page. Just click on that, fill out some of your information, and then one of our team schedulers will return a call to you um, to schedule the actual appointment. So hopefully that answers that question. If you have any other questions, you can see an email address located on the page, programs at mbortho.com. Feel free to shoot any questions you have with regards to this presentation over and Dr. Crovello and I will make sure to get back to you with those answers. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and launch this poll that I was just, oh, look at this. It's, I already launched it. So this is wonderful. Thank you so much for everyone who participated in the poll. It will give us a good idea of what you will be interested in learning about for future webinars. Again, thank you. And if you have any questions, let us know. We look forward to seeing you again soon.